Welcome back. Our spin-free MP panel has returned to set up the next month's selection. Wait, no, that's still a year away. Although you'd never know it by this week's return to the Commons. Conservative MP James Rajat is chair of the Finance Committee and apparently not, as rumored, up for a job in Alberta Premier Jim <laughs> Prentice's cabinet. I'm glad to see that, frankly, uh, Roger. Or yeah, James. Roger. <laughs> Megan Leslie, the next one over, is deputy Thanks, leader Bob. of the NDP, Roger Kuzner, a top MP with the Liberal Party of Canada. Welcome to you all. Thanks. Let's talk about this emergency debate tonight. Uh, Megan, I've been to these things. I've sat there and been the only person observing them. Yeah. The House is mostly empty. There's no binding motion at the end, no vote. Why bother? Yeah, I mean, I think emergency debates have their time and place, especially when there's um, a new issue where you want to actually sort things out and say, hey, where are we going? This is an evolving issue. Uh, we actually need a vote on this. Um, we've asked the Conservatives how many how many Canadian troops are going to be involved in this mission. 69. Yeah, but yesterday it was no answer. Mm. Uh, then I think Paul Dewar was on a panel. Um, I can't remember. I think it was James Bazan was on the panel with him, and he said four. Then it was dozens. Now we hear it's 69. I mean... We need to know exactly what is going on with this mission, how many people really are being are involved, and then we need to have a vote. That's the thing that's missing here. Uh, we have a Prime Minister who said there would be a vote if we were to ever be involved in this kind of mission in the future. There's no vote. Roger, do you feel like is your heart pumping as you go into this emergency debate? You're <laughs> going to get answers and fresh information? Uh, I was in the House last night. I stayed in for the Ebola debate last night and uh, you know there, there were a couple of good speeches and I, I was really impressed uh, Kirsty Duncan did a you know and that's her background uh, uh, you know she did a, a tremendous speech but I, I, you know I'm, I'm disappointed when I, I look across the way and, and James knows that uh, if there's something going on within Jason Kenney's portfolio Jason Kenney comes and stays the whole night uh, in and, and takes in the debate last night you know it, it, this Ebola I, I'm not being an alarmist here or anything like no. that but folks th you know th th this uh, people are dying in droves and uh, we have Canadian soldiers we have Canadian diplomats we have people off in those foreign countries uh, and, and the absence of any kind of ministerial support Minister of Health spoke and and that was it but uh, okay, you, know, you got so your emergency debates mixed up today is Iraq Today is Iraq. Why do yeah. you? Why? Why should anyone care what's going on, or should, is it just a waste of time? Well, I, I think they should care. You know, is, is this prime minister that said, uh, you know, well, it, we should be in Iraq with uh, George Bush back then? You know, so now he's just saying, trust me. I know that Obama came out, and Obama went in front of the press and, and laid out exactly where the U.S. are going to be and what the U.S. are going to do. So, uh, but you know, what's taken from this uh, late night debate tonight? I, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm skeptical. Well, I think in terms of the issue and, and the situation in the region, I mean, it is incredibly serious what ISIL is doing. Right. Uh, I mean, that's evident to anyone who can have access to an iPad in terms of what they're actually doing on the ground. Very destabilizing for the whole region. Barbaric acts that are unbelievable. So, I mean, the you know the world needs to react in a, in a very uh, strong way to this, and Canada is reacting with other uh, allies in terms of doing that. With respect to having a debate, I think it's important. Obviously, the government's position is on the record. He interviewed Foreign Affairs Minister John Baird. It's important for all parties to get on the record and make their points of views known. I, the fact that he took opposition critics to Iraq, I think, was a very good sign in the sense of trying yeah, to make it multi-party. And I would say, you know, frankly, it's it's um, in terms of the vote itself, I, I, I do agree with the Foreign Affairs Minister and the Prime Minister in the sense of, I mean, the combat mission in Afghanistan, in the toughest province in Afghanistan, yep. that is merits a vote in the House of Commons. Something like this, where the situation is very fluid and where there's a smaller number of people going in an advisory role, I would say that doesn't... Uh, constitute the necessary for a vote, but obviously political parties can have different views on that. It when was it, good that the Foreign Affairs Minister brought uh, opposition MPs with him, absolutely. But I'll tell you, Paul Dewar's our Foreign Affairs critic, he came back and he talked to us uh, at our caucus uh, meetings in Edmonton and he said no one asked for military intervention. People begged for humanitarian intervention. That was the clear message from everyone. They said <laughs> this, this is a humanitarian crisis. I mean, Paul's face changed. He, he was pale even just talking about it. And he said that's what everybody asked for. Mm. And yet that's not what we're giving. But, but the Kurds were not asking for some kind of military s support to protect their territory. I mean, I, I just, 
They didn't. I mean, that, that's strong. I don't imagine they turned it down, me. though, would they? I mean, we're providing pretty serious expertise there. This JTF2. I mean, ISA was I think making. We have a, a lot of expertise in humanitarian aid as yeah, well. That's, absolutely. that's part of our role. And, and the foreign affairs minister said that, right? That's obviously one of the three areas we're working on. Yes. So. One thing that comes across loud and clear about this panel is that you guys seem to get along reasonably well without you shouting and and acting like you hate each other like some other panels. But I'm just curious why in the House today there were some curious changes. Um, for example, a, a conservative backbencher asked a conservative minister to trash a Justin Trudeau uh, policy. We had a, a, a military policy rollout against moving within 40 kilometers of a city by retired officers, which is clearly targeted Andrew Leslie, a liberal advisor and future candidate uh, who, who did a move a few blocks and it cost a lot of money. I, I'm just curious, is this what we're going to get for the next year before we have a vote, Roger? I mean, is this, are we seeing the animosity breaking out that's got to sustain itself for another 13 months? Uh, I would think this is pretty much just the appetizer. You know, my, my own thoughts. <laughs> What's the main through, course going to be? Well, I haven't uh, lived through uh, some minority governments and, and minority parliaments where uh, they're in constant uh, campaign mode, and, and really, I, I believe the Conservatives are in constant campaign mode. But uh, I, I think today was it was it was strange, uh, but I, I expect it to become the norm. Uh, that's what we'll get as we get closer to an election. Megan. Uh, Roger brings up a good point about the minority governments that we've had where mm -hmm. everybody was in constant campaign mode. This is new for a lot of us, both uh, people reporting on affairs on the Hill and, and people like me. I've never sat through a majority government where we know a year in advance this is when the election's coming. Um, this is our chance to talk about how we're different from the other parties. This is our chance where Canadians are really turning their eye thinking, yeah, there's going to be an election. So what is it all about? Uh, what are these different parties saying? So you're going to see the NDP, for example, we announced our child care platform. Uh, we minimum announced wage. minimum wage, $15 minimum wage. So these are exciting things that I think an election campaign is 36 days. It's not long enough to talk about issues. So it's exciting, I think, for this year to be about different issues and laying it out. This is what we'll do if we're government. What do you think about that? Do you think voters really snap to attention until the writ drops uh, 36 days before voting day, James? I think, I mean, it's surprising how much, I, when I go back home, how many voters will say, you know, I saw you on Power Play, or, I've, you know, I've people that stopped me in the, the <laughs> elevator at my building saying, I saw you uh, chair of that House of Commons uh, committee on CPAC, and I say, well, you, you did? You had, trouble, you had trouble sleeping last night, so you're watching me on CPAC, and I, I helped them get to sleep, but it's, no, I mean, seriously, Canadians do follow politics. I mean, many of them on an ongoing, very active basis. Um, I would sort of, I wouldn't disagree with either of my colleagues here. It was interesting, I was elected in 2000 where parties used to fight more within themselves and they'd fight with other parties. Then we had the three minorities, which it was, it was constant campaign mode. As Megan said, we've kind of had a period here of relatively stable majority. But as they both said, it's, you're constantly trying to distinguish yourselves as a political party from other political parties in many different ways. I mean, they support a national minimum wage. We don't. Mm -hmm. They want a national child care program. We obviously favor our universal child care benefits. So it is important for political parties outside of a campaign to say, here's where we stand, because uh, Canadians obviously want to hear that. So. I, one of the more anticipated events of the fall is going to be the fiscal update. The prime minister has actually signaled there might be some actual tax breaks in it, which is not usually the case. James, you're the chair of the finance committee. You're in early mode, early hearings mode already. I, I'm trying to get a handle if that means you're gonna you're getting ready to put some meat in this fiscal bones or if it's just a long list of people that want to speak about getting a piece of the action in the surplus well we always have meat on our fiscal bones Don as you know <laughs> um, but you know, if you look at our timetable our timetable for the pre-budget hearings we typically we call for submissions from June to August we translate them get it to committee members we start our hearings late September early October and then we submit the report to Parliament in November December so we're on our normal timetable and we have about 420 submissions this year, so there's a lot of interest by individuals and organizations. There's a lot more interest in the sense of more spending because people see a, a surplus down the road. Mm -hmm. So that'll, that'll be a challenge, obviously, for the government and for the committee as well. But I, it'll be interesting to see what the, uh, what the fall economic update says, especially in terms of whether the numbers will move in any, di in any direction. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm not going to go there with you, too. I just wanted to get him. I quickly want to talk about this case of the Saskatchewan woman, uh, Jamila 
BB, I think it is. She was deported today uh, from Saskatchewan uh, to Pakistan. She. Um, Sorry, Don, I'm interrupting. She was deported? Well, she was going to be she out at 2 o'clock Ottawa yeah. time, so I suspect she's on her way. Okay. Um, her case is before the UN Human Rights Commission, yeah. her, and yet she was deported. She could have been stopped by the Public Safety Minister, Minister Stephen Blaney, but he didn't intervene. I want to play a quick clip, though, from uh, Immigration Minister uh, Chris Alexander on uh, reacting to this earlier today in the House of Commons. Speaker, Canada has a fair and generous asylum system where decisions are made by the Independent Immigration and Refugee Board, not by under political pressure, but according to the facts. And where claims fail, there is recourse to appeals. When those, re uh, when those appeals are exhausted, we all expect failed claimants to leave this country. Was she kicked out too early in your view, Megan? Because this woman's accused of being yeah. uh, committing adultery and in Pakistan that can mean stoning. Yeah, sorry, I actually didn't even know that, that she had been deported, so that's news to me and uh, I'm really shaken by that because um, you know, the UN High Commissioner asked the government, asked the Canadian government to hold off on this until a review had been done by the High Commissioner on human rights. Uh, I can't believe that they went ahead with it. I mean, this woman, uh, she applied for refugee status. She is going home to face possibly death by stoning. Mm -hmm. um, meanwhile, her community here, her employer even at the restaurant where she worked has said, hey, this is a woman who's part of our community. We accept her. We love her. She's got a job. I mean, I I'm, I'm really uh, taken. I, I can't believe it. Roger, quick thought from you. Uh, it's bizarre, you know, that, that it's gone this far and that it, this has been the outcome. I mean, uh, a civilized country does not stone a woman to death for being accused of adultery, and a civilized government doesn't send a woman back to put her in that situation. So wherever the fault lies, you know, whether if it's with Minister Blaney or, or, or with Minister Alexander or the officials or something, they must be getting their advice on dealing with women's issues from the NFL. This is a serious case, and how this can be let go. I didn't realize it was this afternoon that she was going out, but I mean, uh, this is a tragic case. James? Well, but I think we have to acknowledge Canada one has one of the most generous, one of the most humane refugee systems in the world. My understanding, I don't know the details of the case, uh, perhaps as well as you do, Don, but my understanding is her... Uh, she was initially asked to be deported in 2011. Mm -hmm. That was the initial decision, and then she appealed that, and so um, she was not successful in her appeal. Um, you know, it's very hard renting, but it's. I think we all have to sort of say what are the full details of the case. Canada does have one of the most generous, humane uh, refugee systems in the world. So obviously, if if the professionals who work at immigration and refugee believe that this woman does not have just cause to stay in Canada and believe that she should be deported, I mean, I certainly have faith in their decision to do that. Okay. Well, let's hope uh, that there's no consequences when she gets to the other end and that we're just talking about something that isn't going to happen. All right. James, Megan, and Roger, thank you very much. We'll see you next Tuesday. All right. Thanks for coming in.